can use um, called PyTorch. So we are going to be talking to Ari. Um, Ari actually used to be on my team at Microsoft, and now he is a fancy lead of, of a developer advocacy team um, working on PyTorch Lightning. So I'm excited to see uh, what you're going to talk to us about. I know it's something about audio classification. Is that a spoiler? Did I just do a spoiler? So, a little bit. That's just one of the demos, but we're actually okay. we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. Uh, we're we're going to go start high level. We're going to go a little deeper. We'll open things up to questions and we'll make it interactive and I'll show some demos and everything. I'm going to start by uh, sharing out my screen. So awesome. let me know when you guys can see my screen. Okay. And I will start my presentation. So um, here, one second. Perfect. Are you guys all seeing my screen and everything's good? Cassie? Yeah, I just wanted comfort. All right, good. Sorry. Perfect. So let's get started. Perfect. So I'm going to be talking today about a, a topic that's a little bit uh, more in depth around the area of machine learning and deep learning. I'm going to be talking about how you can optimize your deep learning applications without the boilerplate. But don't worry, we're going to have a little bit for everyone. So if you're new to machine learning and you're new to some of these concepts, uh, there'll be a lot of stuff that's accessible for you. But also, if you have a little bit more of a background and you're looking on how to take your deep learning applications to the next level, I'm hoping that there'll be a lot here for you as well. So before I get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Ari Bornstein, and I am the head of developer advocacy. Uh, for PyTorch Lightning and Grid.ai. Um, I'm originally from Washington, D.C. in the States, but I've been living here in Israel for the past five years. I did my undergraduate degree, a dual degree in history and computer science in a school in Baltimore, Maryland, um, where I did my uh, undergraduate thesis in uh, medical document classification. Uh, after that, as Cassie mentioned, I've spent about seven years at Microsoft doing different open source engineering and cloud advocacy roles uh, focused on the AI and ML space. Um, in addition, over the past two years, uh, I've been finishing up my master's in natural language processing at Bar Ilan University as part of the BIUNLP lab, uh, where I did a lot of research in the topic of uh, multi document representation, co reference, and semantic. Uh, embeddings. And recently, as I met, as Cassie mentioned, I joined Grid.ai to be the head of developer advocacy for both PyTorch Lightning and Grid.ai. So I think Gus gave a really good introduction to ML, but just in case some people are coming in now, I'm going to start high level and just clarify by generally the space uh, and, and kind of cut through some of the, the buzzwords around what's AI, what's machine learning, and what's deep learning. So to get started, we have the area of artificial intelligence, which is a general, um, it, which is a general space around how do we model um, intelligent behavior. In here, we have tons of different methods beyond just machine learning, things like game theory, formal languages, and, and formal logic, uh, even dynamic programming that you might have learned in your undergraduate uh, computer science degree. All of this falls under the field of artificial intelligence. Within artificial intelligence, there's a sub-branch called machine learning that we've been talking about. Uh, and in, within machine learning, there are many different types of methods. So there are probabilistic methods. There's graph-based and tree-based methods for doing the different tasks. And there's even methods that are not considered deep learning, but they also use what are called neural networks. And then within machine learning, there's a subset of algorithms that use neural architectures uh, that we've been talking about. And these are deep learning algorithms. So typically, when you're writing deep learning algorithms today, you don't just go in Python or in C and start writing in Scratch like you used to. You use deep learning frameworks. And the two most popular deep learning frameworks are TensorFlow, which we had a great introduction to in the last session, and PyTorch. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit off the beaten path of not necessarily comparing TensorFlow to PyTorch or, 
or going through PyTorch. But what I'm going to talk about is uh, a new topic, which is the challenge of the deep learning boilerplate. So some of you guys might be asking yourself, OK, that's, that's cool, but what, what is deep learning boilerplate? What is boilerplate code, and what does that have to do with PyTorch? Well, deep learning in computer programming, uh, boilerplate code are different sections of your code, which are repeated uh, in multiple places. You use these patterns a lot with very little variation. And when you have really verbose languages, uh, they require programmers or developers, and this happens a lot in deep learning, to write out a lot of a code to accomplish otherwise abstractable functionality. And that code is called boilerplate. Now, where this gets even more complicated is within this abstractable code, it's very easy potentially to just abstract out the code, but because deep learning is such an area of research, it's it, it's very easy to accidentally abstract code and then lose flexibility. And you really need flexibility to go in deep. So we're gonna talk about what happens when you have a lot of boilerplate in your deep learning code. You have a lot of challenges. The first challenge is reproducibility. If I have a lot of dependencies and I have a lot of this code and everybody's implementing it differently, it's very hard for me to just take your code and run it and understand how it works. Often, when we talk about model hubs or model libraries, one of the challenges we have there is that we think of models just as a computational graph of operations inside of a deep learning framework. But in reality, there's a lot more to it. You, the way that you load your data, the way that you transform your data, the way that you apply your data, um, also the different configurations that you set, all of those tie into what makes your model your model and also how to train and get the same results. So if everyone's implementing these things with different variations, reproducibility becomes an issue. Another example of this is in a lot of frameworks like uh, TensorFlow and like PyTorch, you different implementations might take advantage of different hardware. So for example, I might have two models that do classification of cats and dogs, but one model uh, uses CPUs and one uses GPUs and one uses TPUs. Uh, and because the implementations of how to integrate with that hardware is different, uh, when I go now to kind of aggregate the models or take code or concepts from one, it becomes really hard to integrate it into the other one. So the next challenge that I face is, is reusability. Like how do I link code? Uh, this becomes a bigger challenge in terms of boilerplate too, because I can give all my methods many different names. And so then I don't necessarily know exactly what and where different, what's happening in different code that's doing the exact same thing. So for many people, this is a major barrier in deep learning. If you've ever gone online, GitHub, and started opening up like for the original implementation of BERT and trying to read the code and understand, it's very different than the implementation for OpenGPT. And then there's a lot of different variations and tricks, and they're in different parts of the code, and they have different uh, function names. And so read, read, read a, a boilerplate affects readability as well. And the last challenge is reliability. When everybody is implementing the same types of code or the same patterns again and again and again, they're doing. They're, it's very hard to guarantee the quality of that code or that that code is encapsulating best practices. And in fact, due to the complexity, it's very easy to make mistakes. So one of the interesting blog posts that I was reading recently uh, was by Jason Attic, who created uh, a really cool framework called. Uh, deoldify that colorizes images. And he was talking about in his original iteration of, uh, of his model to colorize these images, he was getting this weird blending of colors that he didn't expect. And it turned it out that a lot of that came from the fact that when he went to train, evaluate his model, he forgot to change it from model, uh, to, to, from training mode to evaluation mode. So you can imagine that this boilerplate can be overwhelming and cause a lot of errors. And so where PyTorch Lightning exists and the, the and why I'm so excited about it is it exists to address the challenges of boilerplate. So you might be asking yourself, okay, cool. I've, I, I've heard of TensorFlow. 
I have some familiarity with PyTorch, but what's PyTorch Lightning? Well, PyTorch Lightning is a way of organizing PyTorch. So to make coding complex deep learning research models simpler. It enables those things like reproducibility. It enables those things like being able to reuse code. Uh, it enables readability, and it also enables best practices, which we'll look at in just a minute. So to better understand this, we should look at Lightning's uh, design philosophy. And this breaks down, I'm going to break this down into three major components. So the first component is that Lightning, you should standardize your research code. And in order to do this, you need to modularize. You need to decouple models and your data code from your baseline to increase the reproducibility of your application. So what does this look like? Imagine we have our project. I can actually give you a real world example. Uh, I was interested in doing audio classification. So I read this really cool blog post. I, I looked online and I said, okay, how do, how do I do audio classification with PyTorch? And this was a couple months ago and I found this really cool blog post here that shows, okay, here's how you understand data. Here's how you look at the data set. Here's, here's how you pre-process things. It gives a really good background. Uh, I see a ton of code here. Um, and I want to understand exactly what's going on in all of this, right? Um, within this code, like when, if, if I want to go in and, and try to like reproduce it, it, it can be a little noisy. So we can actually look at the full, um, the full notebook here. And you can see that while this implementation is cleaner than most implementations, there's still a lot of boilerplate code, the way that I declare the models, the way that I, when I, I have my training loop, the way that I have to uh, set my device type and the way that I have to change things, it's very easy for me if I want to now modify and play around with this to ruin this model. So I was thinking, you know, what if there's a cleaner way to organize this code where it's the exact same code, but more organized, and then I can gain by not having the boilerplate. And so to start with, we have, imagine this is all the code we have. And what we want to do is we want to abstract out what code is the research code and what code is related to our data. So we're going to do that here. So the first thing that we do is we have our deep learning code. You know, our deep learning code, and we extract out the research code. And this goes into a construct called the lightning module. So this is what manages all the research code in my model. The next step is we have our data code, and this is all the code for data pre-processing, uh, knowing how to test and do train splits. Because remember, if I take just a model from a model hub, I don't know how the data was processed on that model. So when I go to train that model on my own data, I might get different results. Now I can go through and read through a complex research paper, but often a lot of that data isn't included in the research paper. So by abstracting that out into a lightning module, it becomes something that becomes standardized. And then the code that's left over from the lightning module and from the data module this is the remaining boilerplate. These are the common practices or the common patterns that we see in pretty much every single deep learning application. Things like your training loop, things like figuring out how to manage ranks when you're doing distributed training. And what PyTorch Lightning does is it manages the boilerplate for us. And here is where, honestly, this is where when you're developing deep learning applications or when you're trying to take somebody's code that just runs on GitHub, and then you're trying to figure out how do I modify it or change it, this is where things often go wrong. So what PyTorch Lightning does is it manages that all out and abstracts it into a concept called the Lightning Trainer. So this is our first de design principle, this idea of standardizing our research code, separating out the research code from our data code from the remaining boilerplate. Now, the next step is it's awesome that Lightning is taking care of this boilerplate for us. But as researchers, we want to do crazy things. We want to have different ideas. We might want to do something that's, that's off the beaten track. And often when you're using you know, very simple abstract 
representations and models, it becomes very, very hard because all these details are abstracted out from us. So the second aspect of the lightning philosophy is while we standardize and abstract out the boilerplate, everything should be accessible and overridable. You can override what you need. So for example, if I want to do something like create my own cost, custom loss function or play with the inner details of an optimizer, I should be able to do that and override that functionality, but I shouldn't have to, it shouldn't be forced on me. The next and last aspect is providing the AI best practices. So what, once we take out all this boilerplate for you, what we want to do is we want to make it so that all the best practices that you can, that for training your applications, the things that get your model to converge, that get your model to scale, that you don't have to worry about all the overhead of implementing each of these tricks in all these different ways. These come in as built-in features within the trainer. So things like multi-GPUs, multi-node, TPU training. Instead, you know, if if it, it's one of these really interesting things in deep learning, both in PyTorch and in TensorFlow and when you want to go and start doing distributed training or use a GPU, you have to modify all your code. You have to make sure that it's using .cuda. You need to make sure all these things are working. But if somebody else has another implementation and they're using TPUs, if I want to mo combine different components of these different parts of the different projects, I can't do that because I have to convert every single line of code. So what the AI best practices do here is they enable you to get a lot of these best practices out of the gate. So let's actually look at what this gets you. And one of my favorite parts is let's start with distributed training. So what I have here is I have my model, which is a basic classifier. I have a data module, which is loads up the MNIST data set, and I have a trainer. To train my model, all I have to do is trainer.fit pass in my model and my data module. This is pretty standard. If I were to go online, I can find 100 examples of MNIST. But now let's say I want to run this on a GPU. Today, if I'm doing standard PyTorch, I would have to go into this MNIST classifier and into this data module, and I would have to change the device on every single line of code. Maybe somebody made it a little bit cleaner and abstracted it out, but there's no guarantee. It's not standardized. What Lightning enables me to do is because it abstracts out the boilerplate, if I want to train on a GPU, all I have to do is pass this argument, GPUs equals one. Now imagine if there's more than one GPU on my system. Now it gets even more complicated. Typically in PyTorch, you know, I need to use the distributed trainer and I need to manage process ranks and I have to deal with things like race conditions and I have to figure out how do I accumulate all my gradients uh, when they're distributed across multiple devices? And so what ends up happening is you find a lot of code that could, or a lot of research projects that given a little bit more GPU compute probably could have scaled, but they get abandoned because people who are getting started or who want to, they, they don't have the capabilities to kind of abstract this out. With Lightning, it's as simple as just setting the flag GPUs to eight. And automatically Lightning manages, because I've abstracted out my data module code and my model, it abstracts, it, it manages everything I need for batching my data, for managing all the distributed ranks, for managing uh, the compute in the back end, and just making sure that my model trains. Additionally, imagine I want to take this now to the next level and train that model on 256 GPUs. Traditionally, this becomes this is really hard. It's it, not only do I have to manage one GPU and manage you know all the different processes on one GPU, but then I need local ranks and global ranks. With PyTorch Lightning, it's as simple as GPUs equals eight, num nodes equals thirty two, and now my model, without changing a single line of my training code, is scaling to two hundred fifty six GPUs. We get a ton of other built-in amazing best practice features as well. So one of the things that you can do when you're training a model, there's this concept of precision. Typically, when we have tensors or we have our data, they can be stored as 32 bits or they can be stored as 64 bits. There are different levels of precision. But the, what, what we find is on many applications or many types of models, you can actually reduce the size, the, the 
the significantly reduce the amount of co computation time and compute by reducing the precision of your model. Now this, again, in, in, in standard deep learning, this is very hard because if somebody takes, if somebody implements one thing using one implementation of a component that I need with 32-bit precision and another one with 16-bit precision, I have to manually go through and understand exactly what they did to merge these two code bases together. Because that's abstracted out, if both are using Lightning, I can just pick and choose the code and combine it as I need. And in the trainer, I can just, if I want to use 32-bit precision, I use 32. If I want 16 for mixed precision, I just set it to 16. And this also can run on top of different backends as well. So you can imagine there are a lot more really amazing features here. I'll go through a couple others. So some are like automated model sharding. So this, is, uh, this was a feature in the 1.1 release. This allows me to take when I'm doing distributed training to also distribute the memory uh, and distribute, like break up my model and distribute it across uh, multiple, uh, mul multiple GPUs and multiple instances. And by doing that, just with this one flag, I can reduce the memory overhead of my model by up to 50% in, in some cases. And then here, like I get all these other features as well. So automated checkpointing, um, things like automated inter, uh, integration with logging with TensorBoard. But what's really interesting is let's say I'm using Azure ML, right? And I don't have TensorBoard integration. I can actually add multiple loggers like TensorBoard, MLflow, uh, Neptune, uh, uh, Allegro. There's many different, um, there's many different loggers that I can integrate with. And then in my code, because it's abstracted out, I just have to use the dot log function once and, it, and PyTorch Lightning will manage integrating and logging across all the different platforms that I want for me. Additionally, when we're training, we might often run into bottlenecks. I might train a model, I'll be wondering, why is this taking so long? So PyTorch Lightning in the, uh, provides a profiler which can show me on each of the hooks and each of the functions in my code where, uh, how long they take and what, the, what their mean duration and total time is. And additionally, in the 1.2 release that actually just came out last Thursday, we provide native integration into PyTorch's uh, profiler as well. So in addition to seeing the, finding the bottlenecks within the different training hooks within Lightning, you can actually see it at a low level as well. And one of the amazing things about this is, again, we have a strong community, so the code is regularly, rigorously tested, and we make sure that it runs across different environments, whether that's Windows, Mac, Linux, and different Conda versions as well. And we try to make sure as well on different, uh, obviously on different compute platforms. So when we were talking about readability before, there's a model for self-supervised learning, it's called SimClear. If, if you looked up, if you go online and you start looking for some clear implementations, let's do that. So we can go into Google research and we have a some clear implementation here. See how there's my model, my model utils, objective. There's a lot going on here. It's very, very hard for me to understand how the training and how, how this model actually works, right? There is training and then there's when it's not training and there's a lot of overhead here. And, be, and one of the challenges here is that because there's so many different ways that I can implement this, no two implementations look the same. But when you're using a standardization like Lightning, and I'll go back to my presentation here, you can see that when I want to understand what this model is doing, everything's just abstracted out into the interface in tr my training step. So here I can see that I have uh, two encoders. Uh, I can check, uh, like for my item, like what it's an instance of, and then I have my two uh, projections, and then I have the loss that I apply on the two projections with the loss temperature, return the loss. And it be, my code becomes very clean. So 
One additional element when we're talking about reusability is this enables me now to share these components across projects and models. And because I don't have to worry about the boilerplate, I know that if a callback runs on one version, uh, on, on one, uh, I know if a callback works in uh, a version of PyTorch Lightning, it will work in, I, I can take code that's in one repo and apply it to another repo. So here we can see, like for example, um, if I want to put an adversarial callback here that tries to trick my model by coming up to, to that for MNIST that classifies a digit and I wanna create like an adversarial input to trick it to um, make a, a wrong decision, I can create a callback here for creating essentially confused logics. It applies the same interface. And then in my data module, I define my data module, I define my classifier, I do fit. And then here I can actually, when I, in my trainer, I can provide this callback. And because it works in this trainer, this will also work for other models as well. So these callbacks and this functionality becomes reusable across different projects. And there are plenty of different amazing features from accumulated gradients, uh, stochastic weight averaging, model pruning and the lottery ticket hypothesis, gradient clipping, debugging, early stopping, JIT export, Onyx export, there's a memory profiler, integrated integration with metrics, speed profiler, uh, truncated back proposition, propagation, and, and just a ton of like amazing features that if I were as like a developer to go take one version of PyTorch that I found on the internet and uh, like a uh, implementation of a model that I found on the internet and then try to put these features in, it would be extremely hard for me to do. But if they're using PyTorch Lightning, all I have to do is play with the flags of the trainer and then I can optimize and take it quickly experiment and apply best practices to any model that's using PyTorch Lightning. So there's a large ecosystem. You can see that a lot of the top uh, companies and organizations and research labs in the field are using and building on top of PyTorch Lightning. Uh, we have a global dev community with over 406 uh, uh, contributors, and we're always looking for more. And I want to show a couple uh, community examples because, as an advocate, I always want to be able to kind of showcase work that's being done by the community. And I let's let's take a look. So recently, one of the things that I did is I went through some of the different projects and I put together these posts, and we'll share them in the end in the links um, of different projects and different domains that helped in that definitely inspired me that I thought were really cool and that you can actually look at to inspire your next project. So for example, in natural language processing, we have um, a model called uh, Unitary Detoxify, uh, which is a system for predicting toxic comments um, and which performed uh, really well on all three of the jigsaw um, comment challenges. If I click on this, I can go in the code and I can see how it's using Lightning. And I can also then later, if there are additional new flags or new different ways to um, optimize my model, I can play with those as well. And I can always take advantage of the new latest and greatest best practices by just changing here in my trainer, the arguments. I don't have to go and figure out, uh, override and change and modify complex code. And if I want to understand what the model is doing behind the scenes, I can. it becomes a lot more readable. So I understand exactly how the forward function is working. I understand exactly how the, the architecture is. If I want to say, OK, how does this thing train? Uh, OK, so it takes the batch, um, runs my forward uh, classification. Um, then it calculates uh, cross entropy loss using binary cross entropy loss. I can override that. I can maybe if I want to take this model and I say, okay, maybe binary cross entropy loss with a focal binary cross entropy loss because I have a new data set that's unbalanced. Instead of having to refactor and figure out how everything works or, or, or take the weights of a model that's just 
pre-trained, uh, pre-trained, but it's really hard for me to override. I just go here and I just modify this loss function and apply the loss function I want. And now I have a new model that I can configure and play around with as a researcher. So in addition, we have a ton of really cool community projects. I'll, I'll call out a couple other ones. One is an implementation of Malbert. So this is a state-of-the-art representation learning model for learning molecular structures. Um, the AI2 longformer, which was uh, made like a lot of uh, headlines a couple months back for being a model that enabled wider spans uh, for, for text processing. Uh, and also one of what's going to be one of our first uh, community highlights, and there's I'm a really big fan myself of Queen's Gambit on Netflix. So this uh, model done by a community member of ours, uh, Shubham, essentially looks at chess notation and learns how to play chess without any understanding of the board, just as a language problem, just by doing entity tracking on top of chess notation. So it's really, really cool. So, and, and that's just in the natural language processing space. We also have for com uh, computer vision, you have implementations like sparse image captioning using transformers. Uh, the, the first, the grand prize winner, and I actually even have a post of this of a couple of different grand prize winners for uh, Kaggle challenges, but for this one, the wheat growth challenge was using lightning uh, magically uh, developed this really cool project for end-to-end -end 3D scene uh, reconstruction from post images. So you can give it a bunch of images and it can process the images and then generate a 3D model of the world. Uh, and even uh, Facebook recently, they had a uh, new blog post on this as well, but they were using uh, Lightning to help um, optimize some of the research work they're doing on COVID prognosis. And I'll show one last thing as we transition to audio, because we were talking about audio before. So there are a couple of really cool audio frameworks as well, like NVIDIA Nemo that run on top of Lightning. Uh, so this is a toolkit for uh, conversational AI by uh, NVIDIA. There's Asteroid, which is a really cool um, open source uh, toolkit uh, built on top of Lightning as well um, that enables different architectures for audio se source separation and, and experimentation. Um, there's some really state-of-the-art results on um, urban sound classification. And one of my uh, personal favorite that was made by a close friend of mine, uh, Teddy Coker, which enables, um, which enables you to do, um, it's called PedalNet, and it, it enables you to do a uh, guitar effect emulation. So like if you're really into music and stuff, you should definitely check it out. And here, here's the post, I'll, I'll share the links at the end for different Kaggle winners that have been using PyTorch Lightning and the flexibility of PyTorch Lightning to take their models to the next level. So let's get back to the presentation now that we've seen some community examples. So, I want to show, like before we talked about the audio demo, I want to show kind of what that code from before looks like when I'm in a, when I refactor it for audio classification. So here we have this, and I, one of, one of the first things I did was I made sure to ask the, and, and I recommend this whenever you're doing open source, Open source is a collaborative space and it's really important to be open and transparent. So the first thing I did is I commented and made sure to get the author's permission. I didn't want to just take code and refactor and play with it. Even if it's open source, it's always important to speak with people and, and attribute your sources. Uh, once I did that, I went in and I made my own, um, I, I made my own version of this code. Uh, and refactored it for uh, PyTorch Lightning. So the first thing I did is I defined a data set within um, with using the, the PyTorch traditional data sets. This is to load my data. Here I have my transforms and the, what I need to, to load to get each item. Then the next thing that I do is on top of that, I define a PyTorch Lightning data module. So what this does is this helps me standardize, as we're talking about 
all the things like my seeds, uh, my batch sizes, the number of workers for my different data modules, uh, uh, for my different data loaders. It also enables me to standardize my splits between um, test, validation, and train, um, the number of classes and everything that I need. It also enables me to standardize any of the pre-processing code that I need for generating um, the different spectrograms. So in audio classification, uh, one of the traditional methods that we do to do general audio classification is we take, and, and I can actually show this here from the blog post, is what we do is we take the audio, we turn it into a wave, and then we visu and, and visualize that, and then we turn it into a spectrogram, and then we save the spectrogram as an image. And, the, and then the reason we do this is when it comes to transfer learning on audio, we have a lot more image data, models that are trained on images than we do on raw audio. So we try to take advantage of the features that we learned on images to do classification on the different visual differences between audio sources. So this is a, a strong traditional method for doing audio classification. And what you can see here is once I've done this, I can my, my model becomes super simple. So here, all I need to do is I can just take uh, torch vision models. I, I take the model that I want here, comes pre-trained. Uh, I can set up whatever losses I want. So in this case, cross entropy loss, I'll, I'll treat it as a categorical. I can have my optimizer. This is what essentially enables my model to learn. Uh, I define in my step function what to do, what's a forward step. And then from there, I have my training step function. So this takes in my batches of data and it calls my step function on it. And I also have a validation step that I can do. So that way I can log my validation. And when I do self.log, you can see here that PyTorch Lightning manages the logger. So this can go out to TensorBoard and it could go out to weights and biases or it can go out to Azure ML or any, any place that I want. It becomes gen generalizable and more robust. And then here, when it comes to training the model, all I need to do is I define my data module. I define my audio classification model. I just pass it to my trainer. Um, and then I just trainer.fit. And at the end, then I can just test out the model. So let me go back to the presentation. Hopefully, some of you who have some experience with machine learning and deep learning and different frameworks that you got a lot of value on this. I recognize that there might be some in, in the audience here who are a little bit newer to the machine learning and deep learning space. And so for you, I also wanna make sure that things are addressed and show you how you can get started and take advantage of some of these best practices. And one of the things that I would say personally is that lightning is great for those who wanna get the most out of PyTorch, but what if you just wanna get a quick model and get started? So one of the challenges that I had when I went and refactored this code is I had this model. I had some pretty, I had some code here that was actually pretty cleanly maintained, but it was very hard for me if I wanted to take this code and have train it on multiple GPUs, I couldn't, it would, would have been meant that I had to refactor and add a lot of complexity into this database. So I refactored it into PyTorch Lightning, and now it becomes really easy for me to, um, to do distributed training, to run this on TPUs, to take advantage of whatever I want. But still, there was some overhead for me. I had to convert this over. And when we thought, think about audio classification, right? We said audio classification is, there's some pretty standardized patterns, right? So from a research perspective, I want some freedom and flexibility. But you know, at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm taking audio, I'm turning it into an image, and I'm loading an image classification model. Uh, standard image classification, you know, that's been done a million times. There are best practices for that. Why should I have to create my own modules for that? I should be able to just get a quick baseline. And this was one of my big frustrations in the beginning before I joined Lightning. But recently, we addressed this with a new framework called Lightning Flash. One second here. So. What Lightning Flash enables is it enables you to get to a quick baseline 
that then you can override and play with whatever you need. So here are the key features is you get end-to-end -end deep learning on different uh, on proven tasks in minutes. You have distributed new training in the inference because everything's run on the lightning trainer. I get all of the advantages of the trainer, uh, including distributed inference. It's completely customizable. So everything, because it's built on lightning, even instead of just me getting like a model and not being able to do anything except for inference or train it, if I want to start modifying that model, if I want to change the loss function, I can just open up and override the backbone with my own model or override different components in it. And you can even bring your own lightning modules or lightning modules from the community and integrate them as your own backends. So here are the five steps for getting started if you're not a deep learning expert and you want to just get a quick baseline. But also, if you are somebody who's really deep or a research, a machine learning or deep learning researcher, this enables you to quickly get a baseline so that you can compare or, or get results on a data on different data sets. And then once you have that baseline, you can then start overriding and experimenting uh, without having to start from scratch. So the five steps is the first thing to do is choose your task. Here are three example tasks as well. We have image classification, sentiment analysis, and tabular classification. There are other ones as well, such as um, summarization, translation. Um, we have object detection, and there are new tasks being, we're actively working tirelessly to develop new tasks, such as grasp classification, and I'll show you uh, my prototype implementation of audio classification very soon. The next thing I need to do is load my data set. Once I've loaded my data set, I choose my model backbone. So there are all sorts of different machine learning architectures that I can apply to different tasks. So for example, we talked about like the traditional hot dog, not hot dog, or cat versus dog. There are a lot of different backbones that I could try, like Inception, MobileNet, ResNet, Suave. Um, here I can just choose and play around with whatever I want just by changing the backbone. And then what I do, I can do is I can fine tune. So I can take the model, I can do transfer learning, I can choose to freeze weights, I can choose to unfreeze weights when I do the fine tuning. Um, I can train the architecture from scratch and all of that's configurable with very simple basic API. And then once I've trained my model, I just predict and I have a model that I can use. So I'll show you my sample implementation of what this would look like with my audio example. And then, uh, we'll, th and, and then we'll move on to the next step. So if you'll remember, we had this large uh, code implementation that's actually pretty clean. But like, for example, if I wanted to add TensorBoard or I wanted to do all these configurations, it would have been hard for me to do. I have my lightning configuration that I built. Now, what's cool is, I, what, but I still had to do all this overhead here, right? I had to define the data set class. I had to define a data module. I had to define a model and choose model architectures. With Flash, it becomes really simple. All I need to do is I install Lightning Flash. The first thing I do is I import Flash. So I do import Flash core fine tuning, freeze, unfreeze. Uh, I get my um, from Flash Audio, I import spectrogram classification data, spectrogram classifier, the ESC, which is um, which is a traditional sound classification data set to download that data. Uh, two helper functions for converting from WAV files to spectrograms, and another function that will help me display the spectrograms. I run, I download the files of my data set, and that would download them locally. Then the next thing I do is I just use my spectrogram classification data from folders, and I provide the folders of the data set where my train files are, where my validation files are. And if I have them, also I can put in test uh, folders, a uh, test validation, um, a test data set here as well. For this specific case, um, this data set didn't come with a test folder, it only came with a train and a valid. So I put the split here and also within, uh, and, and then once I have this data, I can, I can train my model. And what's really interesting here as well is that these 
um, that these um, loaders for loading your data, they come with a bunch of other really nice functionality in there, like they can manage splits for you and they can do a bunch of overhead boilerplate uh, and abstract that out for you. So then the next thing I want to do is I train my model. So I just declare a spectrogram classifier. I choose whatever backbone I want. So whether that's ResNet, ImageNet, in this case, uh, sorry, Swab ImageNet, which is a self-supervised model trained on Swab, uh, called a, a Swab trained on ImageNet. Um, I can also do use ResNet, MobileNet. Uh, there's a whole list of different backbones I can try and new ones are going to be added all the time. And then I just declare my trainer. So because it's using built on Lightning, I get all the features of Lightning. So if I want to do for 100 epochs, I do for one epoch. If I want to do, I want to take advantage of the GPUs, I just do GPUs. If I want TPUs, that's simple. And then I have TPUs. Exactly as we saw before. Then we do trainer.fine tune. I pass in my data, my data module, and I can I have all these different strategies that I can use for fine tuning. So freeze, unfreeze. What this does is for one epoch, it will unfreeze the model. So it will update all the weights when I'm training. Um, and then after that, it will um, freeze those weights and only update, freeze most of the weights and only update the the classifier at the end that I append on top of the model. And then uh, here, when I want to test my model, I just run trainer.test and I'll get all any metrics I want. I can configure all the, the different metrics like recall, accuracy, precision, and there's new metrics through PyTorch Lightning that are being uh, developed all the time. I can do trainer.save checkpoint, um, and then I can load this model and I can predict on new data extremely Simple, just do model.predict, or I can use the trainer to predict, and I provide the trainer my model and a new data set or a new data module on, on, on a different set of images. And then I can get take advantage of distributed training across clusters of GPUs, TPUs, and you name it. So I, I hope you can see like how much simpler this is versus this versus this. And that's what Flash enables. Uh, so I'll show you in the repo here. Um, here, um, PyTorch Lightning Flash. It enables me to go in and very quickly get baselines for all sorts of tasks. And we have samples here for image embedding, text summarization, tabular classification, object detection. If you're deep into uh, uh, or, or you're technical and you have a background in deep learning, we're also going to be doing a community sprint uh, very soon. So it's an opportunity to get involved. Um, and then the last thing that I want to show here, and let me just continue, is how do I train at scale without all the overhead of infrastructure? So if I wanted to train on the cloud and I want to train on 100 GPUs or 200 GPUs. Now, there are a lot of frameworks that enable this. Azure ML is a great framework. Uh, SageMaker is another good framework. Uh, GCP also has ML uh, offerings. But there's a lot of overhead that I need to think of in terms of like how do I architect, uh, set up the API, set up my workspace, what uh, what Grid does is Grid provides an interface to kind of enable you to seamlessly train hundreds of machine learning models and experiments from your laptop without having to deal with all the configuration and overhead of the infrastructure on the cloud. So imagine here, you can see I have this Python script that's using Lightning. I can just change it to Grid GPUs. I can choose the uniform learning rate. And just like that, exactly like how I would train on my local instance, it now spins up 20 different uh, configurations on whatever backend that I want. So that uh, grid is in early access now. And if you want to sign up for the wait list, uh, you can do that at grid.ai forward slash sign up. I'll conclude now, and then we can open the floor to some questions. So number one is contribute to open source. It's really awesome. 
Uh, I think I don't think I have to um, convince you of that. And if you're interested in contributing, um, uh, there's a con how to contribute guide in our repo and on our um, docs as well. And I'd be happy to to, to work with you as with that as well. And we'll we'll make sure you get some cool lightning swag. Um, to summarize, uh, PyTorch Lightning provides a lightweight uh, research framework with full flexibility, reduces the boilerplate significantly, um, and enables for you to run your code on uh, any hardware without modifying each of the individual calls within your scripts. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Ari. That was very thorough and amazing. And I have not used PyTorch Lightning personally, but like after this, I'm going to have to go play with um, like refactoring some of my PyTorch stuff to see. Um, it was really neat how you could do uh, like with the params and just to like override, like if you want GPUs or TPUs or whatever you wanted, like in just a parameter, um, I think you called it something else, a flag for training or or whatever the correct language is there. But it was just really cool how it really simplifies a lot of things that were difficult before. Um, and so one of the questions that we had was, if you've already like written a bunch of PyTorch stuff, how hard is it to kind of factor this stuff out into that boilerplate? You showed us a little so bit. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad that somebody asked that question because I actually cut that out of the presentation. But <laughs> since... You asked the question, I can show you. Awesome. So here, one second. Let me just unhide these slides, for, unskip these slides for you. And I didn't want to get too technical without somebody actually explicitly asking for it, but it's, it, it, it's pretty simple. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to move out like the, comp so, so the way PyTorch Lightning works is you have your data module and you have your Lightning module. What these are, what what those modules are, they're essentially interfaces that you can implement. So you just organize your code within those interfaces. I can actually show you here, PyTorch Lightning.ai. We can go into the docs. Oh, sorry, that was the GitHub. Uh, and go into the docs. And so, if I ha I have my Lightning module, my data module here, and it actually shows there's a nice little GIF that We're not shows. Seeing your screen. Uh, Oh, sorry. It's okay. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, let me. All right, one second. You should see my screen shortly. There we go. There's my screen. Okay. So awesome. here, if I go into the docs, I have my Lightning data module. Um, and so what the Lightning data module is, is it's essentially, it's the simple class with organized hooks. So I have my initialize, I have my setup. This is where I would download all my data uh, or I have there's additional hooks that you can you can put in as well, like my prepare data. This is where I would actually download the data. Then I have my setup where I'd go in and, and manage the different splits and trains. I have my train data loader, my val data loader, and there's all this documentation. So essentially what I would do is I would take my code that's in PyTorch right now and where I have this functionality, I just move it over. So where I download my data, I move it over. Where I download, where I apply all the transforms and split, I move that into setup. Where I want to do, uh, where I have my data loaders, so now I split these up. Instead of managing them myself, I have one for validation, one for test, and then all the rest here, all this boilerplate, Lightning takes care of for you. So I can actually here, if I show the script in the beginning, pause here so we can kind of see some of that. So like here, notice you have this if global rank equals equals zero. Why do you have that? Well, in this case, this person is trying to do distributed training. So they don't want to download the data every single time. So they now need to manage all these forks and complexity. Once you've taken these components and transferred them over, you don't need to do that anymore. So that's that would be for uh, the data module. And you can see we actually have, uh, so you do that for, for, first for your data, and then you would do that for your uh, model as well. So here, what I can actually do is I'll show you in the slides. I'll walk you guys step through step through the process. So here, the first step would be to move the computational code. 
into a lightning module. So we replace the NN, the typical PyTorch NN module. We swap that out and it becomes a PyTorch lightning module. That essentially enables you to access all the hooks and the interface of PyTorch lightning. The next thing we do is we configure our optimizer. And now the per parameters are part of the lightning module. And we want that for reproducibility. So instead of it becoming here in the, that this, instead of putting that just and managing that directly in the optimizer, it gets uh, managed by the module so that if somebody else wants to take this code, they'll get the same results. Now we take the meat of the training loop. So in our training step, we can add self.log, so we can add and log anything that we need. We can add a validation step. And then we can also do for, we remove all the CUDA calls because again, all the compute is managed by Lightning. So we just remove those. And then this becomes your Lightning module. And you'll notice in the forward here, because Lightning manages the optimizer for us, this takes out all these things where you have to do optimizer.step or you forgot to type optimizer.step for all these different things and then your model doesn't converge and you have no idea why. You know, Optimizer.zero.grad or, or all these common mistakes that you have when you're training with PyTorch, Lightning abstracts that out all for you. So in addition to this, you have hooks, which then if I want to do additional things, like for example, I want to, if, if I want to actually make these calls myself, I don't have to, but if I want to, I can tie into the hooks and I can override that logic for when I need for, um, for, um, for to have that flexibility if I'm doing research or something off the beaten track path. And then what's really cool here is like, typically you have this huge training loop, you can kind of just delete the training loop then. And then instead of the training loop, <coughs> you use the lightning trainer and here you just do fit model, provide your data in, or you could provide your data in. So, so you actually can pass in your data directly as data loaders. It's not opinionated, but if you want here, you can actually take this data code that we talked about before, you put that in a lightning module, and then it becomes standardized. So I put in trainer.fit data module, and then I have all the flexibility. So if I want to run that now as multiple GPUs, I just put in GPUs equals as many GPUs if I want. If I want to do, uh, you know, if I'm on an Azure cluster and I want to run on multiple um, nodes in Azure ML, I just I have to man I have to, I just have to register in the Azure ML cluster all the default. I actually have a blog post on this, so I I, I need to just register the Azure ML cluster and then. I can just scale this. So the same code that I have that runs on a CPU can run on a GPU, multiple GPUs, and all these other features that I talked about, you get just like that. So, all right, next question. Yeah, that was that was really cool to see that it, it doesn't actually look that complicated to do the, the refactor. No. Like, that's neat because with some oh. of these things, it's like you have to put in all that time to get the benefit. And it's like, is that time with the benefit? But um, that was a really good explanation on how you can take what you already have, make a few changes, and then now you have all this added functionality. So love exactly. it. Exactly. It, it, that, that's actually our, one of our philosophies is, uh, you know, we have this really strong engineering deep learning research team. And our goal here is we want to take all the complex overhead on ourselves so that you guys don't have to deal with it. But if you want to deal with it and you are a researcher, we're not going to block you out. We're going to enable you to override and customize and, and, and do what you need to do. So I actually had a question um, when you were showing lightning flash and, and lightning and you were showing that like it, it was really, really simple to do like, you know, an image classification with audio data using flash. Um, and you could still do all of like the overrides that you could do in lightning. So if I'm going to do an image classification, um, why would I choose lightning or lightning flash? Like what would be the reasons? For Absolutely. That? So, so, so this is, this is how I, I describe it is if I'm getting started, I use flash to get a baseline. So there, 
there are hundreds, if not thousands of different variations for different types of machine learning tasks. Some of them are more experimental, like in uh, reinforcement learning, which we actually support with Lightning as well. And there's some examples of that in Bolt. Uh, some of them are more common that we see a lot. So for example, image classification is a pattern we see a lot. Object detection, pattern we see a lot. For those patterns, it doesn't necessarily make sense for me to write, if I'm not a researcher, even if I am a researcher, to just restart from scratch if there's already code out there. So the idea of Flash is it enables me to take my data, put it into a Flash task, and just iterate to get baseline results. And also, if I'm a beginner, that's a great way to start because then I don't need to worry about what's the back end. I, I can just put in my data, I choose the task, and it will train. And we configure, we, we ourselves, I mean, we don't know for every data set, but we look across general data sets and we'll choose and we configure our data modules to have as generalizable configurations as possible for most tasks. All right. So that's a great entry point and a great way to baseline. Where Lightning is for is then when you want to go off the beaten path or you want to experiment or you want to change things, then you can start overriding and, and changing what you need to do. So I know that we're we're a little bit over, but I'll but I'll give one example of this is just before we sum up. Is today, for example, and again, I love Keras. Like, it's one of like, uh, it's how I started. I started with TensorFlow. Well, I started with Scikit-Learn, but when I started in deep learning with TensorFlow and Keras, but one of the big challenges that I've had in in Keras models, for example, is I have this model. I take it from a model hub. I train the model. It works. Everything is great. But if I want to now change the loss function of a pre-trained model, I can load that model, but it's very hard for me to change that. Whereas here, everything's accessible, it's overridable. So um, Yeah, it kind of helps like with that grabbing different code and running it and you have to go through and reconfigure everything to work where this should be kind of more of like a grab and run, you know, style. Yeah. Of, um, and, and it's about all those things we talked about earlier, reproducibility, readability, uh, reusability and and just enabling people to iterate as fast as possible with the machine learning models. That's you know one of the biggest challenges today is like if if a new state of the art model comes around, you know it's it's become a lot more trivial to find a GitHub implementation of you know a new state of the art model, clone it and run it. But if I want to start like actually experimenting, changing or building on top of it. That's really hard to do, and, and Lightning makes that a, little, a good amount easier. OK, so we're going to have one last question here that somebody asked um, about contributing. They asked kind of what the community's like and um, what kind of contributions are you looking for? I know you mentioned there's like a hack coming up or something for con contributing, but yeah, people want to kind of know how they so, can get involved. So absolutely. So there's going to be like a couple hacks. Like the, the, there's a community sprint that's going to be coming up for people to contribute tasks to Flash. Now, like, again, that's targeted towards people who, there, there is gonna be an application process because some of the things there are pretty deep and pretty technical. Um, so like one of the ways to get noticed or, or to be approved for that is to build on top of Lightning and show us what you can do or what kind of tasks you can build out. Um, in addition to that, like, as we go forward, like, that's why I'm so excited to be ahead and, and, and create a developer advocacy department because I'm hoping to do a lot of really cool events. So once we have flash more flash tasks and we have this underlying API baked out, then we'll do events where we'll help encourage people to build on top of. I'll show people how that they can contribute more cleanly. I'm going to be writing a lot of documentation as well. Um, if you are at that technical depth and you do already want to start getting uh, to contribute, uh, all you have to do is you go to the PyTorch Lightning AI, and here under Contribute, we have all the documentation that you need in terms of the contributor guide. Uh, also, when you're getting started and building out and playing around with, if you ever get stuck, we have a Slack community where we have members of our core team on call, and we divide up shifts throughout the day, and people try to get to any question within the same day. Sometimes even within within like minutes of you posting it. That's really cool. 
Uh, well, thank you so much. That was super informative, really interesting. I think a lot of people have ideas on how they can go start using Lightning and Lightning Flash. And oh, you really should because it's amazing. <laughs> And then um, I will let Eileen, um, I'm sorry, not Eileen, Anna, <laughs> Annaline. Yes. Let me have my fade again. I'm so sorry. Annaline? Okay. <laughs> I'm so yes. sorry. Thanks a lot. Um, these Dutch names are not always easy to pronounce. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks a lot for the presentation. I loved it, especially it really ties in very well with the whole MLOps and data ops um, that we're now seeing a lot these days. Um, and uh, yeah, I will definitely try it out. You have triggered my um, <laughs> attention. Um, one more thing I'd like to mention is that we will be back on March the 3rd, same time, same place. And next week's topic is open source documentation and tools. Thank you for joining. And Thanks. see you next